Hello, and welcome to the Inside EVs podcast for July the 24th, 2020. This is episode number 16. Today, we'll be talking about Tesla achieving full year profitability. The Ford Mustang Mach-E 1400 screams its debut, and Chevrolet has a 400 mile pickup truck planned. I'm Dominic Yoni, Inside EVs editor and Inside EVs forum moderator. Uh, joining us today, we have Tom Logney, multiple EV owner and Inside EVs editor. We also have Martin Lee from the EV News Daily podcast, available on all your usual podcast platforms. And of course, we have Kyle Connor from Out of Spec Motoring and One Lap YouTube channels. He also puts together the super awesome videos for the new Inside EVs YouTube channel. Uh, go subscribe and tap that bell icon for notifications. So welcome, gentlemen of the panel and ladies and gentlemen of the audience. Uh, so this is usually the time when we talk about we have charging up in our driveways. Do you have anything this week, Tom? Unfortunately, I don't have any cars. Uh, the last vehicle I had was the BMW i3, did the range test on that. Um, I'm going to be, hopefully this week, a friend of mine just took possession, just bought a 2020 BMW i3 with range extender. Uh, the last time uh, we did the range uh, test was with the uh, the full BEV version uh, of a night a 2019. So I should be hopping in that at some point this week, doing some charging and range testing with that. But I have uh, another electric vehicle that's not a car. Uh, I just bought yesterday a, uh, and I know we specialize on cars here, but a specialized e-assist, Vado 4.0 SL e-bike, uh -huh. uh, which I'm going to be doing some reviews on for Inside EVs. It's really cool. So far, I love it, um, but uh, I haven't really gotten it out and given it a full thorough, uh, you know, thrashing and, and on-road and off-road, but uh, that's going to be coming up. We're going to be doing a review on that for Inside EVs. So that's in my driveway right now, other than my Model 3, uh, brand new specialized e-bike. That's awesome, man. I, I love electric bicycles, and I'm I'm looking forward to hearing about this one. Um, yeah. So, Kyle, you don't have a car this week either because you're in the wilds of America somewhere. Tell us about where you are. Well, I have a I have my car. I have the Model Three that I've been driving uh, that I own, and it's pretty early in the morning because I'm close to the West Coast in the in the middle of the woods outside of. Jackson Hole, Wyoming. We're in the Grand Teton Mountains. So just to find enough cell signal to do this show, I kind of had to do some driving around, scouting out spots. And if I move one inch forwards, I'll lose connection and one inch back, I will as well. So I'm in the perfect spot. Um, but yeah, we've been on this big road trip about, uh, let's see how many miles into it we are so far. We're 5,891 miles into it and we're just getting started. Uh, it's a beautiful place, as you can see, for our YouTube viewers. And uh, we brought our two dogs with us. We're camping out of the Model 3. Uh, we've been setting up uh, really cool campsites and really just having a blast. We have a whole road trip series going on the Out of Spec Motoring YouTube channel. And then also in between, I've been filming like double or triple content for the Inside EVs YouTube channel, which will all start to air in a few weeks. So pretty exciting stuff. We've been having a blast seeing some amazing sights and the car's performing very well. No complaints. So you, you have that car loaded down to the gunnels and, and there's a box on top, a Yakima, uh, what do you call that box? Yeah, it's the Grand Tour 16 by Yakima. So how, how are you finding your efficiency? Like, are you coming close to uh, expected range? Yeah, what's interesting is I think it's maybe on par or just a tick higher than this car is with the normal 20 inch performance wheels. Uh, I have 18 inch uh, lightweight wheels, not arrows. They don't fit on performance upgrade model threes, but um, with the 18 inch wheels and the box, I have averaged uh, 320 watt hour per mile over the last just about 6,000 miles, which is what this car typically does on the 20 inch wheels without a box. So that thing's incredibly efficient. I mean, I was expecting way worse we had to do a 249-mile stretch from Sioux Falls, South Dakota, to Fargo, North Dakota. I don't think a Tesla has ever done that stretch. And um, because the, the supercharger network just went live in North Dakota only a couple weeks ago. That's we right. We were one of the first to go across. And, uh, yeah, the car did it fine. We, we had to average about 60, 65 miles per hour. But other than that, 
it's been great. We've been cruising at 85, how we typically drive. Speed limits are quite high out west, and, and it's been quiet, and it's held on. Awesome, Gary. If you, hey, you, you had mentioned, too, that you, meet, uh, you might turn that thing around, like the Yakima box, and try that. You haven't tried that yet, right? Right. Well, so many people have reached out and said that the boxes could be more efficient flipped backwards. And uh, I mean, sure, we should try that. I just haven't had a great opportunity to do that yet. And also from a safety perspective, I don't want to run the box like that for too long loaded up because the bars are uh, like a U clamp. And so they fit into the uh, the uh, crossbars like this. So if I put it backwards, all the wind could be pulling it off of the crossbars. Um, I think it's worth it for a test. It's probably fine for around town if you really clamp it down, but I wouldn't run the whole trip with the box backwards just due to clamping safety. Gotcha. That's important. Alrighty. So let's uh, talk about what's going on. Uh, so Tesla, for the first time ever, they've strung four profitable quarters together, put them in the black for a full year. Uh, the Q2 2020 profit was like 104 million on rev on revenue of uh, 6.04 billion dollars. So that's not a lot of profit, but it is it is a profit. Uh, so that's not bad considering the whole pandemic situation and the Fremont factory was closed down for some time. Uh, some people have downplayed that achievement, pointing at the revenue from regulatory credits, which was like 428 million, which is a lot. I think is probably the most they've they've had in a quarter. But uh, revenue is revenue, and you know if you know that you have that coming in, then you can you can speed up growth, which takes cash, or you know, you can cut prices, which Tesla has done on different things over time. So you know it's yeah, revenue is revenue, profits profit, and in the end, uh, Musk made it clear that. Large profits aren't really the goal, like on, on the uh, earnings call. Uh, so in line with the company's overarching goal, which is to accelerate the advent of sustainable transport and electric technology, he wants to sell cars as cheaply as possible and still make still make profit. Because there's, there's a whole world of, of gas-powered cars out there that need to be replaced. And the more affordable the EV, the faster they can be replaced. So to that point on, on the earnings call, he mentioned it would be reasonable to assume that we... Oh, that's right. So moving on just from the, the, the pro whole profit part, because, you know, we can read that. That's all on inside EVs. But um, just get at, uh, he was just hinting at different, there's a lot of news actually on this earnings call that we want to talk about. And this one interesting thing. So it would be reasonable to assume that we would make a compact vehicle of some kind and probably a higher capacity uh, vehicle of some kind. Yeah. So well, I guess a Model Two might be coming eventually, but actually he he said there's a they have their hands full right now I guess with the Model Y and the Cybertruck and the Roadster and the Semi and so what do you think about this news, Martin? Well, look, it's amazing news. Congratulations to the the team at Tesla for uh, achieving this. They were closed down for seven weeks. It's a huge achievement to, uh, to, to for any company, any automotive company. Elon made a point of this in his comments to say automotive has been down 30%, and yet Tesla has managed to eke out a profit. How they did that, you're right. People have been arguing and debating online. Well, it's only because they've got these credits and all those kind of things. But as, as Dominic says, revenue is revenue, and uh, you can't blame them. For, for getting those because they get them because they're making electric vehicles and the and the other car makers aren't um, yet and so you know there were some other factors to take into uh, account with these numbers like they were they didn't have as many uh, people on the payroll so yes they were shut down for seven weeks but in the US at least they made some savings and yes Chinese Gigafactory uh, continues to do really well but still big investments happening there with uh, some big projects building out the Model Y infrastructure and of course uh, gigafactory berlin's so they're spending plenty of money as well they're not just uh you know producing the cars that they're set up to produce loads of bits of information in this call that's really exciting about like we all knew it was going to be texas we all knew that they were going to be building their next gigafactory i'm sorry terra factory there so that was interesting that they chose that call to uh, to confirm it so we're looking forward to uh, Model Y for the East Coast, all the Cybertruck and Tesla Semi being made there as well. And yeah, as, as Dominic just mentioned, the smaller car and the mass transit, which Elon mentioned, which, and you know, I'm a, I'm a pretty big fan 
of Tesla. And I thought I'd put on my, my Tesla T-shirt today. It's subtle, but you might be able to see it. Uh, just just to annoy just to annoy the people who listen to my podcast that say I uh, I talk about Tesla too much, and then the ones that complain that I don't talk about it enough. Um, so I so. Uh, he has, I, I will call him out on this. It's not the first time Elon has said, yeah, we're going to make a small car and yeah, we'll do a uh, mass track, you know, uh, a high volume vehicle like a Tesla bus. I don't know the year he said it. I want to say 2016, 2017. Um, he's either said it or tweeted it before. Um, and and again, he was very non-committal when he made his comments. He was like, yeah, it makes sense to do it. So it, it's very much not a product announcement that he made, by the way, but understandable that he want to talk about those things. He was in a... I wouldn't say giddy, but certainly a very bullish mood and a very confident mood and, uh, and and congratulatory mood. So well done to all the team at Tesla. They were patting themselves on the back. They deserve that in the wider context as well. And uh, plenty of uh, stuff to get our teeth into today. Yeah, it was a, it was a pretty good result. Uh, that uh, Making four quarters in a row, that makes them eligible to uh, join the S&P 500, which is it's not automatic, but it now they're qualified to having you know a year's worth of profit and uh so gives them some amount of respectability i guess or it gives uh, the the investment community confidence in the, in their future so and that could that could uh really do things with their share price uh, and right now it's uh it was actually actually right after the call in the morning after the call it peaked out at like a, over seventeen hundred dollars it, and it dropped a bunch. I think it's around fifteen hundred now, which is still like crazy high valuation for what they're doing right now. I, in my in my opinion, I'm I'm not a financial expert of any by any means. Um, but anyway, so yeah, the big news from the call is that the Gigafactory, as you can see on the screen here for our YouTube watchers, is going to be placed in Austin, Texas. So Terra, Texas, or Giga Austin, we don't know how we're going to call that yet. It's a twenty one hundred acre site. Should employ like five thousand people. And they'll manufacture the the Model Y, uh, the Cybertruck, the Semi, and the Model Three for customers on the eastern part of the country. And actually, the Model Y is for the eastern part of the country as well because that's still being made at Fremont. Uh, so it's right as uh, Elon said, it's right on the Colorado River. This is like a nice loop. It's uh, pretty close to the airport. It's like right inside this kind of big big loop of the river. So he says they're going to actually we are actually going to have a boardwalk where there will be a hike and biking trail it is basically going to be an ecological paradise birds in the trees butterflies fish in the stream and it will be open to the public as well so not closed and only only open to tesla so expect uh, and expect texas to allow tesla to sell their cars there actually at stores in the near future which they haven't been it's one of those there's some of the states don't actually allow this american company to sell their cars, you know, that, because they don't use the traditional dealership method. Yeah. So that's pretty crazy. So yeah, on the call, they did talk about, um, with the new, with the news of the Gigafactory, they, he also laid out where a lot of products will be made in the future. So we have, like we said, the Cybertruck in Texas, um, model Y and model three in Texas for the Eastern part of the country and the semi and the Cybertruck, and then Fremont will have, uh, S and X for the whole world, the production there, and uh, Model 3 and Model Y for the western part of the country. And the Roadster is going to be built in California. He didn't specify Fremont, but, uh, you know, it's got to be Fremont, right? Uh, they probably wouldn't do that at the, at the design center. And, of course, uh, China has the Model Three, um, or, yeah, Model 3, and they're still building the Model Y section of that. And on the... Uh, on the earnings report, if you go to the uh, actually the site, they talk, they have, we have some pictures of the, of the uh, inside of the Chinese Gigafactory. Uh, probably the Model Y, I think, because there's a bunch of robots with still uh, plastic over them. And then he talks about a bit about the uh, Berlin Gigafactory. They're going to be building three Gigafactories on three different continents you know, later this year. And so, yeah, the, and the Model Y will be built. is one of the big things built at the... Uh, Berlin Gigafactory. Uh, so other interesting things from the call, they talked a lot about uh, full self-driving and autonomy. Uh, Elon said right now he is driving an alpha build of the full self-driving software. And he said it's profoundly better than what people realize. Uh, we have really big conversations about uh, full self-driving capability or autopilot capability. 
um, I, you know, I'm, I still don't like that he calls it full self driving when it's not actually full self driving yet. But that's another that's another story. Um, so he said it's getting to the point where he can go from his house to work with no interventions, despite going through constructions and wild, wildly varying situations. So he's confident about having this full self driving functionality uh, being complete by the end of the year. I, I think he said, yeah, we, we'll, we'll probably roll it out this year. We'll be able to do traffic lights, stop, turns, thrusts and everything pretty much. And after that, it's like small improvements. I think he refers to it as a march of nines, like going from uh, 99.9% to 99.99 to 999, et cetera, et cetera. So, and he says like a FSD now is like a 2D. It's like a series of pictures and they're transitioning it to be more like a 4D, like a video, uh, 3D with the time element. Uh, so uh, Kyle, you use uh, autopilot a fair amount. Uh, what do you think about the possibilities of this? How do you feel about this big change coming? Well, I, I think we've heard about this change since 2016, haven't we? It's uh, And it never has happened. The, the, the crazy thing that people don't realize is the technology of, of autopilot, which is purely driver assistance in its current form. It's adaptive cruise control, lane centering, and then it stops at predetermined stoplights and stop signs in full self-driving cars. I mean, it does some cool things, but in essence, it really is just fancy cruise control keeping you in the lane. Uh, Elon has said that in, what is it, 2017, they were going to do a, um, uh, a cross-country drive, and then in 2018, and then in 2019, and it just hasn't happened, and it's such a big problem. Uh, you know, I, I seem to think that the, the cars are under-censored for poor weather conditions, uh, and I think it's fine. I think the cars can do it with the right programming on a sunny, warm day. Um, but I, you know, it concerns me that when I drive in the rain, the car can't see where it's going. What makes it going to be able to see in three years from now that it can't see now without sensor changes. So on that side, I think this whole FSD, what, you know, there's really, I guess the SAE levels are being rewritten now, but for the most, someone can claim their full self-driving and still only do it in a certain area or under certain conditions um, where other companies may be a little bit more conservative, but have better technology in the long run. So uh, no question, autopilot's amazing. I use it 99% of the time, actually 100% of the time I'm on the road, on the highway, the car's in autopilot. And it, all it really does for me is keep the car centered in the lane and the distance from the car in front. And it's really good at that. But what it's not so good at is oh, there's a truck pulling out in front of me, or there's a car that's half on the shoulder, half here, and oh, let me slam on the brakes for this overpass. So it's, uh, you know, it, it, there's a lot of issues that I think people currently overtrust the system uh, due to the naming of, especially the full self-driving package, uneducated customers think, oh, I bought it, let me put it in autopilot and go text or go to sleep. We're not there. And I will put a lot of money on saying we will not be there by the end of this year. So uh, I, I think all of this is just just more talk to uh, appease people. But we've heard about this FSD thing for so long. The cars haven't gotten that much better. My car still slams on the brakes for the same overpasses it did four years ago. So I, I just don't see it happening by the end of this year. I see it at some point, maybe, maybe, but not this year. All right. So Elon's got some uh, got some skeptical customers out there to convince. Right yeah, on. I mean, don't get me wrong. I think we all love autopilot. Sure. No, uh, no, I, I get you. I got yeah, you. Yeah. It's just it's such a huge problem to solve. And if maybe yeah. they're holding that much back from the consumers, but you'd think if it'd be a little bit better, they would make our experience a little bit better and safer uh, with right. the system as well. Right. If I was the Tesla engineer and I knew the boss had some sort of alpha build uh, to, go, to go from his house to work, I'd make sure that route was really, really, really well programmed into the system. <laughs> That's a good point. That's a good point. You have some thoughts on this, Tom? Yeah, I mean, I use autopilot all the time also. And, and you know, I mean, I don't need to reiterate what Kyle just said. It's the same thing. I have the same issues where in certain areas it always would make the same mistake or slam on the brakes when I'm, when it's sunny out and I'm going under an overpass where there's a, um, you know, a, a dark shadow and it doesn't know what that is. And it's really, uh, it's a problem when that happens because if somebody's tailgating you and the car slams on the brakes, they could be into the back of you before you could even react. 
So it's not like a little minor problem. And, 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 and as I've mentioned already, um, I've already had two or three instances where I, I was on autopilot and I would have crashed into like a concrete barrier or something if I didn't take over. So, um, and that's in construction zones and, 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 uh, you know, when different things, uh, uh, strange things come up, but this is what happens. You know, every, the world's not, you know, geofenced. Like we, we, we can't control everything. Things are constantly changing. Trucks are breaking down in lanes. Tires are falling off, you know, the debris falling off the back of vehicles and laying in the road. So, I mean, I, I'm in Kyle's camp and I'm sure Martin oh, is, it would agree with this, that, you know, there's no way that we're getting this by the end of this year, you know, and, and, uh, you know, I guess by my count, I think it's three years now. I think Kyle might have said, I think 2017. I think I, I could be wrong, but I think it was 2018 when he said he was going to do the cross country um, drive. So I think this is three years now where it's been promised, and it's it's not going to be here. Absolutely no way. Um, the full 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 self driving will, will not be uh, being sent out to to Tesla owners at the end of this year. Um, you know, you can bet on that. Um, and one last thing I'd like to add on this, the whole Tesla topic before we wrap it up, we're talking about the regulatory credits earlier. Yeah. And, you know, I can remember back in like 2013, you know, when analysts were saying, well, Tesla's only alive because of these regulatory credits. And they're going to be gone in a year or two because everybody's coming out with electric cars and they won't need to buy them from Tesla anymore. It was like seven or eight years ago. And everybody's, you know, while all these other OEMs are, are, are rolling out electric cars, nobody's selling enough of them that they don't have to buy more. You know, there's only a couple companies out there that may be floating their own, you know, selling enough uh, uh, plug-in cars where they don't need the regulatory credit. So, you know, you can't discount that. It's revenue and it's still here. And I think it's they're going to be selling them for a while because, you know, while all these other companies are beginning to introduce pretty good electric cars, nobody's selling near the volume that they need to to comply. So, you know, you can't just discount that. That's that's part of what Tesla's doing and its revenue. And at the same time, as Martin mentioned earlier, it's amazing that they did report a profit because of so much investment that they're making out there. They're building all these factories around the world. It's not like they're barely breaking even and they're just you know, saving every penny that the company makes, they're still in that, you know, growth mode where, uh, you know, Elon said, you know, by the end of the year, they're going to be, they're going to have three factories that are currently, you know, in production on three continents. So it's like, you know, I mean, uh, it's amazing that they're even breaking even at this point. So credit to Tesla. We like to criticize them, you know, on, on, on certain things, but this is something to be a little celebrated about. They, they've done a good job. Yeah. And in terms of making the cars as well, I saw some comments this week from people saying, you know, the automotive industry was down because it's not just the fact that their factories were closed, it's because they have these elaborate supply chains because they're putting together so many thousands of bits to make a combustion engine. And those supply chains got disrupted by COVID and people saying, well, this was a one off. Of course, Tesla was going to do better. They make electric cars. They're really simple to make. Look, it, they may be they, they may be more simple to make than a combustion car. But last week, I think we all purchased Sandy Munro's BMW i3 document, and that's 27,000 pages long. There are a lot of bits to put together in an EV. So let's just dispel that one as well. It's not like there's like four wheels and a motor and a battery to bolt together. It is a tough job to do, an incredible achievement, but sure, combustion engines are still harder, and that's maybe why the rest of automotive was down more than, well, it, it, they bucked the trend. Well, Elon mentioned some of that on, on the call. He was talking about the, the supply chain being, you know, very, very difficult, you know, to to build even for for what they're doing. And they've been they've been having to fly parts, you know, in order to keep that all coming together and make make the their get the production going. And they're yeah. So and the just a couple of things about the Tesla again before we move on to the next thing. But he's he was saying that the real limitation on Tesla growth is uh, self production at an affordable price, and we can expect them to expand their business with Panasonic, who they work with at the Gigafactory One in uh, Nevada, and with Cattle, which is the Chinese company, and LG, the Korean uh, battery maker. Um, yeah. Oh, there was another little interesting thing. Just the last thing before we move on. It was a kind of interesting. Um, he was talking about uh, using uh, the Chinese uh, batteries for uh, for Chinese Model 3 production, which would free up uh, 
the good energy dense batteries for semi production. Then he also said, uh, which was that? Okay, I get almost free, freeing up more energy dense cells in for semi and other product other projects. So there's something else out there that needs these high density batteries. And uh, you know, we had a little thing on the inside of these uh, last week about the Palladium project with this kind of maybe Model S, maybe Model X Plaid versions. We're not sure what's coming, but this should, there could be some exciting products uh, coming out this year. I would on. think that's that, that's that's certain that S and X are going to regain the uh, the crown, as it were, as being the premium vehicles that are worth a hundred thousand dollars. Because at the moment, well, they've only just caught up with charging speed, peak charging speed, I should add, and it doesn't hold it that long. And although those those cells have had improvements on the chemistry over the years, don't get me wrong, they're not they haven't stood still. They're still asking people to pay forty, fifty, and sixty thousand dollars for a three or a Y and then 80 or a hundred thousand dollars for an S or an X. And, and, and that's, you know, the, the, there's such a huge difference in, you know, the S and the X are almost becoming niche cars now because they, they really don't make and sell many of them. Um, they bunch them together in the uh, reports as well. Uh, they bunch the three and the Y together too, but they do need to put them back on a pedestal. Not as much as the roadster, don't get me wrong, but they do need to, I know people are obsessed with, Oh, the, the, the screen should be, uh, you know, landscape, not portrait, so it all matches. I get that, but just generally in terms of te the technology, they need to make it a little bit more out of reach. And then those cars, once again, I think, you know, will be worth the 100K uh, for those. It, it just puts a halo around those two cars. Yeah, and I like to think it opens the doors to make a more premium car with Model S and X. Yes. Because if you get out of an, an S class or a 7 series, um, you know, it, it's they're beautiful cars. They they drive like bank vaults. Model S and X do not drive like bank vaults. Uh, they drive great, don't get me wrong, but they drive like an E class or a 5 series. What they really need to do now is make a bigger difference, what Martin was alluding to, make a bigger change between the the three series equivalent, the Model 3, and the uh, seven series equivalent, which should be the Model S. And uh, I think they have a lot of room for improvement here. I honestly don't even think they need to focus on performance so much. Let the three shine with track mode, with its on-track handling. It's very good. There's no reason to water down your big luxury sedan that no one's ever going to take to the track anyway and make it super performancey. Make it extremely comfortable. Get those buyers that wouldn't buy a Model S that bought a Taycan because they want to drive a premium bank vault. That, I think, is going to be the key. And if if they can do that for $100,000 or the starting price of ninety five dollars or whatever it is, uh, honestly, I don't think price is the issue. People will buy it if it's that good. Right. I think uh, Musk has said in the past they don't really do refreshes. Or they just do like continual improvements. But I think for the Model X, Model X, they need a, a total do-over, a ground-up, new, new vehicles. Call them something, give them new names even, you know, just, just to differentiate them from the past product and, you know, set a new bar for quality. Maybe aim at, maybe aim at Rolls Royce or, so they, maybe they're not going to be like $500,000 cars, but, but, you know, approaching that level of quality when you get in, you know, like you say, it feels like a bank vault, like everything's solid, you know, premium, premium materials, maybe not dead animals so much, but, you know, they can, they they can do better, I think, than what they have. Right. Yeah, oh, a hundred percent. The car. I mean, you get out of any normal premium sedan. Even the I was in the new Hyundai, or I guess it's a Genesis G eighty or G ninety, whatever it is. I'm like, this is so much nicer than a Tesla in here. And I get it. The Tesla's a, a rolling laptop on wheels, but they're you know so is the Model Three, and that's why they don't sell S's. There needs to be a premium element to Model S, and honestly, it's not very premium on the inside, no matter what people who own them want to say. Right. And it wouldn't, I don't think it would take that much extra in cost either to upgrade those materials. You know, if, but if you throw another $5,000 into the interior of the car, you know, when they're making it. Yeah, I, I'm no expert on that. I honestly don't know what goes into it, but I know like, you know, let's take Audi, for example, they have like the executive director of glove box latch design. Uh, Tesla doesn't have that level of engineering uh, uh, power, more or less. So I think that the Model S reflects what Tesla was able to do. Okay. But I think even today, they could go farther uh, with the engineers that they have now. But again, how much effort is it worth? Are they going to sell a million Model S and X for a full ground up refresh? 
or should they just get Cybertruck to market or should they get roads mm. out? Um, you know, th- where is their effort best spent? And honestly, thinking about it, it's probably not worth it to upgrade SNX and just kind of let them die off. I uh, think, I think this is been running for people who need the space. This is where Tesla have done an amazing job at, at defining the conversation in, in the electric vehicle market. Um, and I'll, I'll be quick, by the way. I know we have to move on yeah. um, because Elon made a point on the call. Um, so the background to this, they dropped the standard range plus Model Y, and so uh, which is going to do less than 250 miles, maybe 220, 230. And then uh, I, I speculated at the time on, on my podcast that actually is this a very clever thing that Elon's doing because he used the phrase that the, uh, the, the, the range was unacceptably low, which I thought was interesting. Very specific phrase he used in his tweet when he dropped the model. And then on the call, he went even further and said, anyone making an EV less than 300 miles, that's the new benchmark, right? So, because that's what Tesla are really good at. They're great at performance, and they're, they're clearly, they have a clear lead in battery and efficiency and uh, motors, and they're very, very good at that side of it. So they are defining the conversation about what you need in an EV, which is 300 miles, which is 0 to 60 in two point, and two and a half seconds or whatever. Uh, and and then the, the car makers that are able to make these luxury cars, I love that phrase. They, they're like a bank vault. You're right. You close the door. You don't know what's happening in the outside world. It's amazing. They've got nothing to come back at because they're making EVs that are doing 220 miles and are, and are slower. And all of a sudden, they get a bad press. And these luxury car makers just need, they just need their marketing departments to wake up or, or anyone needs to work out how to, to attack the Tesla message, which is, our cars are lovely. You know, if you are selling in that market, the hundred grand market, I'm not uh, in buying in that market. You just need to uh, think that there's more to a car than the things that. But that's it. I'm what I'm doing is it. It sounds like a backhanded compliment. I'm praising Tesla for defining the conversation and making everyone think it's all about either range or speed. Good on them. They've done it, but no one's taken the battle to them. Right on. Well, there's there's product coming, and, and we've been seeing that forever. There's you know electric cars and competition coming, but uh, you know we have a lot of things coming. Like uh, for instance, the Ford Mach E. I believe this fall is, is that come out this fall. Right. It starts production. Uh, anyway, deliveries will happen before the end of the year. Right. Right. So, and speaking of Mach E, uh, this week we finally got to see the Ford Mustang Mach E 1400, and this is pretty awesome. Tom, want to tell us about this? Yeah, so I'll, I'll go over quickly, but I know Kyle wants to talk about this because Kyle That's is right. like the, the resident, uh, you know, track maniac guy. So, uh, you know, I'm sure he's chomping at the bit, but uh, um, I had a chance to talk with uh, Ford's uh, global director of motorsports, uh, Mark uh, Rushbrook, about the vehicle um, right before they announced it. And it's uh, just an amazing, amazing car. Uh, seven motors. It's got the uh, Three motors up front, four in the back. They're the um, axial flux motors. They're stacked like pancakes, uh, you know, on top of each other. And uh, 1400 over, they call it the Mustang Mach-E 1400, but it has m- more than uh, 1400 horsepower. Uh, they, they won't, they wouldn't uh, try to get the amount of torque out of it. And they they just, Mark just kind of laughed. He, 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 he wouldn't even release those numbers, but he said that, the, the vehicle can be adjusted to have more or less like each motor. They can, they can just even on the fly ad- adjust them so that they produce more power, less power, really amazing vehicle. You can see it there on the video. Um, it's, it's made as a demonstrator. This isn't going to be raced. Uh, it's, it's made to do, you know, everything drifting um, sort of like a NASCAR, but it, it, it only has a top speed of 160 miles an hour. To really compete in NASCAR, you've got to go 200 miles an hour, so that they wouldn't use it for that. Um, it has uh, four seats, uh, which well, proves that this car isn't just going to be out on the track. What they're going to be doing is taking it all over. Um, they said it's a global car. I asked them if they were going to bring bringing it to Nuremberg. Um, they just kind of smiled and said, well, we're not going to comment on that. Leads me to believe that they're going to be doing things like maybe even Pikes Peak. Uh, with this car. So this is going to be showcased. We're going to see this at a lot of events all around the world. Ford's, Ford um, is um, really proud of this. And uh, uh, Vaughn Gettin of RTR, who's the one that was uh, the, the brains behind this and did mo- most of the work, um, you know, they're all super proud of it and uh, just an amazing vehicle. Uh, I'm going to pass the baton over to Kyle because I know he wants to talk about this car. Right. Well, I think it's an important car just 
in terms of showing what electric can do. Uh, it, you know, traditionally, I'm not a huge fan of concept cars. I, I like to focus on things that people can actually buy and drive. However, this is going to be a great vehicle to showcase at traditional racing events, whether it's Formula Drift, whether it's a NASCAR race, an IMSA race, whatever it is, and put people in there for hot laps and show them what electric can do. Uh, the seven motors is a cool design. The battery pack is an 800 volt system, which is really great for cooling. It's only, I think, 58 kilowatt hours, something like this. Pretty small battery pack. Um, but, you know, it has a good charging curve. Can Not great, but it can charge to 80% in just under an hour, I believe. And, um, you know, it'll be fine. They bring, bring uh, big diesel generators to power this thing up on DC power. Honestly, that doesn't even really matter. What this is going to do is it's going to show the real car enthusiasts, car fans who have not quite come around to electric power, which is totally fine, um, but it's going to really show them what's capable uh, of these things and the noise that it makes and the the just the way that it goes about. And I've, I've been able to see this car, you know, obviously in all of the spy videos and maybe in person, and it's uh, just an insane beast is the only way to describe it. And I just love that there are four seats in it. You you heard it in person, like we can hear it on the video. It sounds like I, I think it sounds like a an anger drill set, to, to like the meltdown or something. <laughs> yeah, it's it's honestly very loud. Uh, it sounds really raw, really cool. Um, you know, does it replace the enthusiasm of a big V eight screaming from a from a traditional car enthusiast perspective? I don't think so. But what it does do is it's just another way to have fun with cars. And that's what I love about it. And Kyle, you mentioned about the battery. There's a reason why it's a, it's a 57 kilowatt hour battery, slightly under 57 kilowatt hours. And that was because um, uh, Rushbrook told me that they wanted to be able to just pound it for an hour. And, right. and then, you know, a, an hour of just nonstop tracking and then have to recharge it. So that's why the goal was to be able to, to, to you know, at least get a full hour at it out of it in in between recharging which they should be able to get with 57 uh kilowatt hours maybe not you know uh you wouldn't be able to drive it at 160 miles an hour around a track for an hour with 57 kilowatt hours but just you know um really hammering it and and sliding sideways and you know uh starting stopping you can do that for an hour in, in between uh recharging i wonder how many of these they'll have out there um, as far as we're aware, there's just one, but I think yeah. there should be more. I think that's a one-off though. The, to, that's the impression I got. I, you know, I, 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 I don't think I specifically asked that question, but the way the conversation went, I'm pretty sure this is, this is a one-off and they're going to learn a lot from it. They're going to learn a lot about the 800 volt battery systems. They'll learn particularly about cooling uh, that we talked a lot about, you know, how, how this is really an important vehicle um, not only to showcase what electrification can do, which is I'm totally on board with what you said, Kyle, that this is what this is going to be awesome for us. Take this thing to these track events and show all like the, the real motor heads, the petrol heads, the guys that, you know, love racing, what electrification can do. So, but besides that Ford really seems to be really taking it serious about learning, using this as a test bed for their future electric vehicles and a lot of that has to do with the high performance vehicles and keeping the battery battery systems cool. Um, because as you know, uh, you know, a lot of the existing EVs, I mean, BMW has been notorious for that, Kyle, as we, we witnessed ourselves with the, with the Mini Cooper SE, you know, if you hammer the car, an electric car for even a short period of time, you can go into reduced power mode because the battery or, or, or the, the motor, you know, starts to get to that, the red zone and, and it cuts back power. Um, you know, Ford seems to be really serious about trying to really thoroughly understand that so that their, their performance electric vehicles in the future will be no compromise. Yeah, you can see on the, on the front of the car, I believe they have like a, a fan kind of unit for each motor. So there's like three, three fans in the front and three, and they're large. Cooling is, is a big thing. And this, uh, like you, you couldn't get the uh, exact figures out of, of uh, your contact there at Ford, but uh, I saw on road and track, they spilled some beans in it. These are Yasa, Yasa 
W or Y A S A P four hundred R series motors, which are they're rated for a, a peak of two hundred and fourteen horsepower and two hundred seventy three pounds of torque each at seven hundred volts. They were also using the Conaseg Grigera, so it's for some uh, pretty nifty technology going on there. So uh, speaking of eight hundred volt systems, Chevy uh, revealed plans for a four hundred mile full size electric pickup truck buried in its annual sustainability report. Uh, they, they mentioned that this truck, and there's a little doubt to to me at least that it will be built on the GMC Hummer EV uh, platform, which also is said to get about 400 mile range from its 200 kilowatt hour battery. And uh, so I, I think it'll likely have that same 800 volt system that the Hummer Hummer has. Um, and it'll be it'll be interesting to see if it has like the same motors because that thing has some crazy performance numbers nailed to it. It's like three seconds zero to sixty which is maybe not as fast as like the fastest Tesla, but we're talking like full-size pickup trucks and like Hummer EVs going zero to 63 seconds. is kind of, uh, kind of insane, I think. Um, yeah, that's pretty cool. Did you see this Kyle? Yeah, I did. And, uh, you know, I think it's great. I think, um, it's great to see the, the, the large OEMs, especially Chevrolet going big with batteries. I mean, 200 kilowatt hours is the right amount of capacity for a pickup truck. Yeah. Uh, you know, I've usually been a fan of, uh, you know, only carry around the battery pack that you need to get to your daily driving. So in the case of most people, a model three standard works fine or a mini Cooper SE even is a more than enough range. However, uh, I recently met up with uh, Model X uh, uh, people, and they are called the All Electric Family. We camped together in Iowa, and they tow a trailer, a camper, with their Model X. And their efficiency at 60 miles an hour goes from like 280 watt hour per mile to in the high 800s just from adding a camper trailer. And I imagine these pickup trucks will be able to carry some really big loads. And, um, you know, I, I, I see that the need for big battery packs, I also see the need for EV specific trailers with maybe their own battery packs and motors to help with regen and power output. Um, we've seen a couple different takes at this, but you know, if you're going to tow something, you need a lot of battery capacity, whether it's in the car or in the trailer. It, it's just, you know, it has maybe even brings your range down to 25% of what it was. Yes, I, I definitely agree with that with the 200 kilowatt hour, but I will add one thing to that. I think there should also be an option for a smaller pack because so many people that I know drive pickup trucks like cars and they don't tow anything with them. They don't haul anything with them. It's like their family car. So, th so you know, it, 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 if uh, these large pack were to be standard, you know, that would ra radically drive up the cost of the vehicle um, and to an extent lower the efficiency of the vehicle. So I'd, I'd all be for like, you know, a 100 kilowatt hour pack as the standard pack and the, the 200 kilowatt hour pack as, as optional. But it absolutely needs to have, as Kyle said, like, if you're it's, if it's a full size pickup truck, it needs a 200 kilowatt hour pack to work to do any kind of work or towing or you know uh, middle America where the, the you know the you've got to drive you know 80 miles to go to the drugstore. So um, yeah, 100. Uh, I'm with you with that on Kyle. But I know so many people that just use full size pickup trucks as like you know you know to to drive 10 miles to the store every day. You know, and uh, the only thing they're hauling is their kids in the back seat. So we should definitely have a, a, a smaller pack option. Right. Rivian has a, a, diff, a couple different battery options on, on their truck, which is coming out early next year. Uh, Rivian and, has it nailed, I think. They have the whole uh, uh, system completely pat down perfectly. They've captured the attention of the uh, general public. They have the right specs and they have the right pricing. So I think GM's got a tough target with that one. Yeah. Well, who's got it tough? I think is Ford, actually. I mean, they've already shown off their their electric F one fifty, but man, I don't know that it gets four hundred miles. Or you know, I mean, they do have a, a a deal with Rivian, so they they might have an electric pickup truck. Though it's more likely to be an SUV, but yeah, yeah. Well, keep in mind, Ford has been notorious for under promising and over delivering. Yeah, uh, we've seen this with Mach E specs the whole way through, yeah. uh, and they're 
you know, they have Rivian to dip into. So I'm fairly confident that anything the Rivian can do, if Ford really wanted to, they could dip into that technology pool and throw it in their F-150 battery electric. So I, I would say let's wait till we get closer to, to compare it. But I think Ford is, is specifically giving you worst case numbers first, the opposite of some other companies that we know, and then going, you know, to make it a little bit better. Well, if they, if they haven't, uh, if they didn't have like a, a big range number like that, oh, never mind. before, I think Chevy, you know, coming out with this kind of, uh, you know, they're thinking about it now. Yeah, it'll Definitely. light the uh, fire under them for sure. That's right. Competition well, is good. Well, I mean, Kyle said that Rivian's nailed it and they have, but not for the work truck. That That isn't, that's an adventure truck for the family. Um, you know, the bed's too small. It doesn't have the specs to be a really good work truck. That's where Chevy and Ford, I think, can really take advantage of the electri electrification of the pickup truck. They, th those trucks have to come out and they have to be traditional, you know, Silverado, F-150 type vehicles that are meant to work. Uh, if they do that and, and offer the right package and the right battery, the right power and the right options, I think they'll, they'll do really fine against Rivian. Uh, personally, but you know, the, I, and I love what Rivian's doing, but that is not a work truck, right? Yeah, that's a good point, Tom. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah, and, and it remains to see re remains to be seen exactly how practical, like the Tesla Cybertruck, is for for work. There's been, you know, some it doesn't have like a traditionally shaped bed, so some people are, you know, I don't know if we can make that work or not, but we'll see. I mean, there's lots of interest in it. They're going to sell a lot of them and everything, but. Yeah, it's going to be a cool to once they get They're that enhanced. A lot of cyber trucks to non pickup truck owners. Yes, I think so. I think that's very fair to say. Yeah, I'm not sure how I feel about that exactly, but yeah. But uh, speaking about Rivian, Tesla has filed a lawsuit against them on claims of stealing trade secrets and poaching employees. The Rivian has hired a number of employees. The issue seems to stem from like just, I think, four of them who Tesla believes took proprietary information with them. Uh, Rivian denies the allegations. Uh, and we should note that uh, in the past, in, in 2017, uh, or, yeah, run, run, or maybe it was late 2016, but Tesla was suing uh, a former autopilot director, Sterling Anderson, over a claim that uh, he poached employees for a new for a self-driving car venture called Aurora Innovation and in that case in that case uh, Aurora paid like a hundred thousand dollars to Tesla as a part of a settlement to cover the cost of future auditing to ensure that uh, Anderson wasn't keeping or using any of uh, Tesla's intellectual property so I, I kind of think that's the same play here Martin did you hear about this yeah, look, and people, it's a small industry and people are going to move between companies and there's a difference between changing your job, which you, know, you can't stay in the same job forever. Uh, there's a difference between moving on. So say the four of us get poached to do a new, a brand new podcast uh, called Outside EVs, uh, right? What they, <laughs> what they can't stop is is saying, hey, so over the road at Inside EVs, what did you guys do and what did you learn and how did you do that? And so that's all part of just moving jobs. And it, yeah, it sucks because your head's full of knowledge. Um, then what is not cool is if you if, if, we, if we turn up with binders and binders of, well, this is how the website works and this is the CMS and this is all of the analytics on oh, here. So that's a different that's a different subject. And actually, that's not on and that is a company's IP and, and they're, they're entitled to defend that legally. So uh, obviously, as you say, Rivian is, uh, be careful what we say, Rivian's denied any wrongdoing here and it could be, okay, I'm not going to speculate because it's, it's, it's legal, but um, it, it's very, very hard to stop people moving on and you can't make people forget what they know uh, already as long as they're not turning up with you know, floppy disks full of files. Right on. Anybody and else have any thoughts on this? Yeah, one other thing you, you have to remember, Tesla... Um, in addition to the lawsuit that you mentioned, Adam, Tesla sure. also has a current lawsuit with X Motors um, because oh, they, they had uh, one of their autopilot, um, one of Tesla's autopilot engineers, while he was working for Tesla, downloaded some source code from Tesla, which um, it could be against company policy, but it's not illegal while you're employee to do that. Um, then that employee later on left and went to work for X Motors, which is the um, U.S. affiliate of Xpeng, which has the G the um, the new P7, which just came out, that has 
you know, X-Pilot 3.0, which is a fairly advanced uh, um, autopilot type system. So um, that's moving on right now. Uh, that, that what happened was Tesla had demanded to see um, X-Pung's source code. And X-Pung, um, oh, that amongst many things, and from what my had conversations with X-Pung was they did pretty much everything Tesla asked. Of course, they denied that they had anything to do with this, that yes, they hired this guy, but that he didn't bring anything to them. They never got any source code, anything like this. Um, and when they found out that this was going on, they immediately put the person on leave uh, and provided Tesla with pretty much everything they asked for, except they wouldn't turn over their source code to Tesla, which I, I don't blame them personally for, you know, that Tesla isn't turning over their source code to anybody else. So this finally got litigated just a couple months ago and a judge in California sided with x -Pung and said, yeah, they don't have to turn over their source code to you. Um, what we'll do is what Texpung, what x -Pung offered to do last year, that they would turn their source code over to a neutral third party that a judge appoints. Um, and the judge said, we find that reasonable that you turn it over to this third party. Tesla will turn over their source code to the third party and the third party will analyze it and decide whether or not anything in there seems like um, was copied. And that's actually going on right now. We should know in a couple months um, what the results of that was. But, um, you know, uh, so Tesla, you know, they, they, as they should defend the, you know, vehemently defends their own IP, which they should. But, um, you know, in this case, and, and I did a lot of digging. I wrote a few articles on this. Um, you know, th th there really was no proof of, 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 of any malfeasance. There was no proof of anything wrong was done. Only the fact that, well, yeah, this guy used to work for Tesla. And while he worked for Tesla, he downloaded source code. Then, you know, a few months later, he ended up working for, for, for Xpeng, which, you know, it, it looks fishy, let's face it. And uh, Chinese manufacturers have in the past stolen and copied, you know, IP from American and European companies. We're not going to deny that. But you can't paint everyone with a broad brush and say, well, because that's happened, um, it's happened again here. Um, you know, it's, it's a good thing that this is getting litigated and that it's getting um, uh, fully investigated. And we're going to know whether or not, you know, anything uh, inappropriate was done here pretty soon, hopefully. Yeah, I don't. I don't think anything big is going to come out of this, but you know, it, it keeps everybody on their toes. At least that you know, everyone's everyone's minding their p's and q's when it comes to like hiring on and and uh, intellectual property, et cetera. All right, hey. So uh, moving on, we saw this was kind of interesting. We saw uh, the Mercedes Benz EQC already uh, testing, but it looks like an an R class or something. So the Mercedes already has the EQC. They just just launched it, right? And but already we're seeing like a brand like it looks like a brand new ground up EQC. What's going on here, Tom? Have they, have they launched Martin? it in, in the US though? Have they launched it in the US or is it still under the future section? Uh, not, yeah, not, not the US now. Yeah, so I think it's still under the future banner if you go to Mercedes Benz USA. Right, but so, it's in Europe. Yeah, and if they're making an if they're making a version two now because. That car is built on the uh, same platform as the GLE. Right. Uh, they've stuffed the batteries where they possibly can under the, the the back seats and all kind of things. And so the the new EQC will be on its own dedicated platform. We won't rehash the conversation we had last week about what's the best way to do it and pros and cons. So there's the question of actually if they're, if they're making a, a new EQC that's a 2022 year model, will this one, the one that we have, ever make its way to you, can you ever buy an EQC in the US before this new one? I don't know. Maybe they're just they'll go straight to this one. Possibly, be a real shame. It's a nice car, very luxurious. Right. It's like they got religion on that whole ground up EV or you know com combustion engine uh, vehicle turned into an EV because uh, that's a really quick turnaround. And there you can see it there, and it looks a little different shape, and it's a little lower. Well, I mean, it may not be an EQC. It may be a. It may be another model. Uh, right. that they are the developing because it's not it's not su as 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 much of an suv uh, shape as the current uh, eqc so it could be it could well be something else uh, right. uh, it's exciting so right. we we know that something coming from mercedes is that that nice like, uh, that, that nice crossover it's not even a crossover actually 
it's a hatch. So um, it's just a, a, a <laughs> blurring, blurring different segments now, but it's, it's a hatchback that's not quite a sedan, a bit taller. It's a wagonish crossover hatch. Wagonish crossover. So. Yeah, let's add that to the official <laughs> category. The wagonish crossover. Right. <laughs> well, that's the thing because there's the V90 cross country. There's the E class wagon with the lift kit on it. Uh, there's the Audi All Road. That's a totally. That is a category. Right. <laughs> it's the wagonish. <laughs> I mean, people get bored of shapes after a while. I mean, the crossovers have been hot forever. So, you know, I think it's time for them to just you know, kind of cool down and something else to kind of bubble up a little bit. And usually it's an evolution, you know, and we've seen the crossover get like coupified, which we know Kyle loves and uh, <laughs> not so much. No, I think that I did, again, I'll always say it because it doesn't make sense. Why would you spend more money for a less practical, uglier version of the same car? Right on. Hey, so, Tom, I believe we have some uh, other news out of, uh, uh, from Neo today. Do you want to tell us about that? So the funny thing is um, Kyle didn't even realize he was teeing this up. Uh, so so oh, Neo jumped up very Neo, well. Neo just announced pricing um, at the Chengdu Motor Show in China for the EC6. Now, the EC6 is the coupe version of their existing ES6 SUV. Mm -hmm. So it's exactly what Kyle was talking about. Um, it, it's the same ver vehicle, except um, less practical. <laughs> but right. um, I, I think it looks better. I mean, that, I, I, I really like the, uh, how the EC6 looked. I was actually um, at Neo Day in December uh, of last year when they introduced the EC6. And it's kind of like in between a Model Y and Model X size-wise. And um, I just love the proportions. I thought it looked really great in person. And um, and I drove the, the ES6 extensively in China, uh, used their battery swap system. Yeah, there's, there's the picture of the one that was on display that I took the picture of. But the, um, I drove the ES6 extensively. Great. I mean, Neo makes some really good vehicles. I, I'm super impressed with them. High quality. The interior, the materials are, are, are fantastic. We were talking about, you know, maybe Tesla stepping up their, uh, you know, what they do on the interior. You know, if that's important to you and you're, and you're in China, um, you know, you would def definitely choose a Neo over, over a Tesla because they're, the fit and finish, the materials they use on the interior are actually absolutely luxury, beautiful. Um, and they're priced um, in, you know, competitively with Tesla. They're, they're a premium brand, Neo. So the new EC6 is going to uh, start at uh, about $52,000. It'll go up to about $75,000, depending on what um, style you get it in and what size battery. It comes standard with a 70 kilowatt hour battery, uh, but you can also get a 100 kilowatt hour battery pack. Uh, and, uh, you know, I don't have a, really the official range ratings, everything there is NEDC, um, but the small battery pack is, um, I think like 270 miles NEDC. So, um, that might be around 200 miles EPA. Uh, the hundred kilowatt hour battery pack is, is just under 400 miles NEDC. So that would probably be good for, you know, around, uh, 300 miles on, on the EPA scale. So, uh, good long range vehicles. And of course, with Neo, you get um, uh, free battery swap. Uh, it's unlimited. You can go to their battery swap stations whenever you want, as many times as you want. If you're too busy to even go there, uh, you know, and you can arrange so that you know when you arrive at work or wherever, a Neo employee will come pick up your car, take it to the battery swap, swap it out, and then drop it back off. So um, they 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 really put themselves in the premium segment. And uh, I'm looking forward to seeing the EC6, um, how it performs um, sales-wise. I think it's going to do well. Right. And do you know if they're going to sell that in Europe? I don't have any official um, word okay. on that, but, you know, they have been sending some cars there for journalists to test drive. And so, I mean, that's the first step that you would get. Um, you know, I, I if you were to ask my opinion on it, I, I, I think Neo uh, sees themselves as a global manufacturer at some point. And, yeah, uh, we've, had, we've had them in Norway with uh, um, an adapter from the GBT plug, which they're, they're Chinese cars, uh, and then a, an adapter to charge them. So we have had them in Europe, yeah. 
They do sell them there, Martin. I know they were there, but I didn't know that they were selling them there. Already. No, no, no. They're not selling them. Just the review yeah. ones. They're, they're, literally, yeah. they're literally the Chinese ones they've just shipped over for review. Um, and they've even got the Chinese plugs on the side. They come with adapters. But the, they are with journalists here um, uh, to have a look at. So that is, as you said, the first step to um, selling them over here. And, and you know, why not? Yeah. Well, what when is the large first- version called? The ES8, is it? Yes. The, the full size SUV ES8. Yeah, mm. I got to spend some time with that, and I was really impressed actually oh. with just overall build quality and design. I thought it was quite nice. Oh, cool! I didn't know that. Yeah, what did you think of Nomi? Yeah, Nomi was cool. I got to meet the. So I went to their uh, uh, offices in uh, Palo Alto or San Jose, just in that area. I forget exactly the town, and we got to meet everyone who works on the software of the cars. It's all done in the U.S. And so we met uh, uh, basically the guy who's uh, in charge of Nomi. It was pretty cool. Um, that's a big thing for them. Uh, you know, having this this integration of, of AI and an assistant that goes from your car with you outside of your car, and integrates with the rest of your life. I think uh, they're definitely on that trend. We'll be seeing more and more of that as we go forward, you know, with Alexa and a few other things. But uh, overall, the, you know, I got the, what I really wanted to see was I wanted to see a production Neo and I was able to see, I think the only one in the U S at the time. And uh, yeah, it was, it was very cool. Very nice. The people behind it are very bright and uh, I I'm big on Neo. And I think that uh, they have a bright future. And honestly, we were talking about this yesterday in one of our group chats for, at inside EVs. We, we don't know why they don't sell them in the U S yet because it makes so much sense to bring them over here to this country. Well, they had that. They, that was when they when they first launched. I mean, that was they had the global ambitions. That they had offices here and they had you know uh, PR here, and they ran into money problems and they had to cut that back. And then you know they just focused on China. I mean, they're still making their vehicles at another vehicle manufacturer's plant. They don't have their. They had to get permission from the Chinese government to have their own plant, and that hasn't happened yet. But uh, yeah, and I, I like the the Nomi is a. The, yeah, artificial intelligence and has a little thing on the dash. His little expressive eyes. It moves around. It looks at you. It can take you can tell it take a picture. It, it you know it just interacts with you. It, it kind of uh, humanizes the car a bit. It's kind of a neat. I think that's a. I think that's a really. I don't. I can't even. Man, Don. The one thing that was really cool about that, let me say, was when I drove it. Um, it, that the Nomi, you know, it has eyes and really like kind of realistic looking. It looks right. at you. It looks at who's ever talking in the car. So even if you're, say, in the back seat, you know, behind the passenger, it looks in that direction. It knows where the sound is coming from. And it looks at who's ever trying to talk to it. Now, it was a really cool experience. But what I will say is it didn't speak English. So I couldn't <laughs> communicate much with it, you know, but you know, uh, the, the people in the, the, the near representatives that were in the vehicle with me, they would, you know, I would, you know, tell them, you know, ask Nomi to, you know, route me to the battery swap station and they'd say it and, you know, the navigation would start working and, you know, I'd say, you know, ask Nomi where there's a place to eat. I want to get a hamburger or whatever. And it would, you know, it would find me local places, uh, you know, that were nearby. Uh, and then you could even tell it like you want to do multiple things and it would route you you know, try to figure out where, what the best area is. It, it really worked well. I just wish I could have, you know, communicated a little better with it. All right. I just want to say, Nomi, take us to the weekend because that brings <laughs> us to the end of our show. And I'd like to thank you all for joining us. Uh, if you have any comments on any of the topics on today's show, you can comment on the uh, Inside EVs podcast post or, or the YouTube comment section or on the Inside EVs Forum podcast thread. And don't forget, you can find and follow all of our panelists on Twitter. Uh, Tom is at Tomalog. Martin is at EV News Daily. Uh, Kyle is at Out of Spec. And I'm Dominic underscore Y. Click subscribe and tap, tap that bell icon for notifications. And we'll see you all next week. Ciao.